So it, sometimes it comes out like that. And so I, I know this came out good because I've already preached it to myself. So I'm hoping it comes out good tonight with the rest of the congregation. 2 Samuel chapter number 13, verse number 1 says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Abnon, the son of David, loved her. Praise God. Let's go ahead and pray together that God would anoint this service, he would anoint this message, and that he would anoint the remaining of this service. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you, we praise you. God, bless the ministry of this church. God, touch each individual that is sitting in this place that is under the sound of my voice. God, I ask you to touch the on fire tonight, to touch the lukewarm and the backslider's heart tonight, God. God, touch those, amen, each individual that is sitting in this congregation. I pray, God, that you would dispatch angels into this congregation, God, amen, to get our attention, to minister to our needs, amen, whether it be spiritual, financial, healing, anything that, Lord, that we are desiring, that we are, amen, needing right now from you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would touch right now in your precious wonderful name. I plead the blood over this church in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise because he is worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated tonight in Jesus' name. Brother uh, Valdez, I don't know what to call this, so you just have to name it after the end of this service, but uh, I do come here tonight Amen, with a burden in my heart. And I want to reach, amen, people tonight that are sitting in this place here tonight. So if I could have less distractions, if you're busy with something, please stay in the house of God. Praise God. I don't want no one really moving or getting out of the service. I really need everybody in the house of God here tonight. I know we have a youth banquet or some sort like that at, directly after the service, but if you could hold off, and be in church with us, amen. Uh, we're living in a world, if you would agree with me, you'll say amen, but we're living in a world and a society today that is very dysfunctional, very bad. Uh, there's a lot of hatred, a lot of malice, a lot of strife, a lot of anger, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. There's so much in this world that we live in, and really when you read this text in 2 Samuel chapter number 13, verse number 1, you find that, uh, the 13th chapter, it's one of the darkest and most memorable chapters of David's story. And if you read along, you'll notice chapters 10 and 11 and 12, uh, they are chapters that reveal David's uh, backsliding or downfalls, as, as you would say. Uh, as David was an anointed man, a man that carried the prophetic promises of God, and, but somewhere he got lost in himself, and let me tell you something, that's very normal to get lost in yourself. We're all going to have downfalls. I think the biggest struggle in today's society with our Christians is the fact that when you fall, you don't know how to get back up. But I'm here to tell you that when you do fall, I'm telling you grace and mercy is available for you. You don't have to backslide just because your, your past says you did this wrong and then, you know, I just can't live for God anymore. No, no, no. What you got to do is you got to tell yourself in the mirror, I'm better than you, I'm stronger than you. There's something inside of me that wants to live for God, but there's something on the outside of you that doesn't want to live for God at all. Praise God. Amen. But he lost himself, and you find these people uh, raised in an ungodly environment under a man who's doing what he can, but he's getting lost in the way while he's trying to do what he can do. Praise God. Now, just because... That job or that opportunity uh, looks beneficial doesn't also it doesn't always necessarily means it's the will of God. Just because something looks tangible or it's good, it may not be God's will. I know people that tell me, "Ooh, I felt the Holy Ghost in that." Let me tell you something: they're not feeling the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of people that will blame God for a lot of things, but it's not. It's sometimes it, it's not God. When you consecrate your life, listen, the Bible says in Proverbs 14 and 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Just because it looks good 
Hey, listen, ribs are really good, but they're not good to your body. Cake, so good, but it's not good for your body. Now, if you eat carrots and you eat fruit, natural sugar fruit and all this other stuff, that's good for your body, but nobody wants it. But if you force yourself to eat it, one of these days, you're going to start to slim up and your pants are going to go from 38 to 32. And you're going to be like, whoa, praise God. But I can't stay away from burgers. I'm going to tell you something. Your flesh don't want to live for God. Tonight, you don't want to be in church, but you want to be in church. You don't want to lift up your hands, but you want to lift up your hands. There's a difference between God's spirit and the spirit of humanity. You'll find in the introduction here in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, verse number 1, it came to pass after this, after what? After that, the introduction of ungodliness of a man that had lost his ways. And there are these dark chapters where David's life is literally wrapped up in the life of Jesus Christ and the promises of the Messiah coming. Now, I find in this text out that this is the darkest ages of humanity. Uh, this comes the brightest light of covenant promises to David. But after this, we find the beginning of these three children of David. Listen, David had three kids. He had Absalom. He had Amnon. And he had Tamar. And each, I'm going to go through three of these things because this is what the Lord spoke to me about. I didn't even know this was even in the Bible. But there was three different persecutions in the word of God. There was avenge. There was vengeance. And then there was victimizing. All these three things. Started to pray. God brought up these names. Said these are the sons and the daughters of David. Praise God. But after this we find the beginning of these three children of David. Absalom the son of David had a fair sister. The Bible says whose name was Tamar. And Abnam the son of David loved her. It is here in their fallen situation that Absalom begins to look and see his brother. And Abnam, son of David, begins to find the way to hurt, to victimize against his half-sister. And so the tragedy of all this is that David's sons and daughters was a wreck. They were all a mess in their life. Everything was shambles. Everything was so messed up in their life. Praise God. And so the story goes, and it's such a hard passage because... We don't want to see David in this type of situation. We want to see him in a great situation like the Bible says later in the dark ages. But here in this, you'll find in the story, Abnam had a friend who they tried finding a way to violate his sister, to bring her, amen, to, to the tragic end. And the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 13, she begs him, don't do this. Don't do this. And the Bible says in verse number 15, and Abnam hated her Insignally and hated her that 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 her great that uh, uh, his hatred towards her was greater than the love that he had for her. And Abnam said unto her, Arise and be gone. She said unto them, There's no cause of this evil to send me away is even greater. Hallelujah. We all live in a world where there is dysfunctionality of the spirits that are abounding in this world. Spirits that come against us. Spirits that's coming against us tonight. There's spirits that are talking to you right now. Listen, because you're in the house of God doesn't mean the devil can't mess with you. The only way the devil can't get to you is if you put the aura of the Holy Ghost all the way around you. And you got to open up your mouth beyond measure and you got to talk to God and say, God... Plead the blood. In the name of Jesus, I take authority right now in the name of Jesus Christ because the Bible says that every devil will flee at the name of Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. But this story, it's not a fairy tale. This is actually what happens today, what's happening right now. Real lives were hurt and impacted in this story. And I like to preach to the spirit tonight of Abnon. And I want to tell it right now, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. Amen. You're not repented and you have sinned greatly. But even if you are the most horrible person in this story, you deserve to hear the message of what I've come to preach here tonight. There are some folks that I don't agree with 
because of their reputation of how they put life upon themselves, of what they do to themselves. And listen, everything you do in this life, praise God, everything that you do, you can have the favor of God if you put yourself and apply yourself in the Holy Ghost. Or you can live in shambles because you don't have a walk with God. Praise God. Amen. But somewhere I've got to get through to them. God has to get to them. Amen. To stop their ungodly actions before it affects the rest of their children. Or the rest of the family. Or the rest of the people. This world isn't perfect. There are broken lives. How many would you agree that there are broken lives in this world right now? There are brokenness. Everything is broken. There's broken reputations. Amen. In this life. I would tell Amnon tonight, you probably deserve to die, Amnon. You probably deserve to die. You're a horrible creature to violate your half-sister. But I'm going to tell you, Amnon, you can't understand this because you're locked up in this chapter somewhere in 2 Samuel. But Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 1 said, This is the lineage of the son of Abraham, the son of David. Amen. The son of David. I would preach to Abnum tonight. Abnum, you have a brother. You have a brother. And Absalom, you can't see it. He's going to call you to dinner. He's eat up with, uh, uh, with, with vengeance against you. With so much hate against you. Absalom, he's going to have you. But Abnum, you don't know this. You can't. But down the course of time, you have another brother who is able to have another brother who has died for your sins. He's died for your sins. One brother is going to kill you, but then there's another brother that's going to heal you. Oh, I know I'm getting somewhere because it's going to hit, it's going to hit home right here. Praise God. You got one brother that's going to try to destroy you, but you got another brother that's going to try to lift you up. This is what I'm saying. You've got a brother that's going to try to seek and destroy everything about you in your walk with God. But you've got to remember, you've got a God that was kin to his brother that's going to lift you on high. That cannot touch you or do anything to harm you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Abnum, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this, Abnum. Abnum, you're blinded by your lust. You're blinded by your anger. And when you have dinner with your brother, he's going to portray you. And daddy's not going to be there to protect you at this time. And in that moment when your father isn't there, your brother is going to tell his servants, take a knife and put it inside of him. Kill him for what he did. Because vengeance deserves this. But Abnum, if you can hear the gospel. Abnum, if you can hear me preach. You have another brother who is not Absalom. You have a brother named Jesus Christ. The righteous who will die. Yes, you deserve to die. You deserve to perish. But there is another brother coming. Another brother coming who will climb on top of a cross. Amen. Who will take the nails. Who will give the blood. Who will be able to take on the bitterness of this world and will be able to forgive you of your sins. And most of all, who will die for you. Amen. Abnam had an opportunity to turn his life around. Vengeance had an opportunity, had a chance to lay down the sword. But their actions took them down to a dark path. You have an opportunity tonight, folks. Listen to me. You have an opportunity to make a difference. You have an opportunity to make a difference in your life. You have an opportunity to make an impact in your life. Amen. In fact, I'm going to say this. You have an opportunity to make an impact on your children tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want to preach to Absalom for a minute. The Bible says in the book of 2 Samuel, when David heard these things, he was wroth and very angry. 
but he did nothing. He didn't do anything. Because of the ungodliness godliness he lived, he was living in condemnation. He was living in guilt. There's one thing that's the enemy is trying to destroy you tonight. It's the spirit of condemnation. Condemnation is trying to take the lives of many Christians. The Bible says that hell hath enlarged herself beyond measure. That means there's no measurement of the size of hell tonight. There's no size because it's innumerable. It's, there's multitudes that are going there. And there's so many people that if you could walk into the stairway of hell and you can walk down there and you can talk to some folks, what got you to this place that would say, I turned my back on God when I knew I shouldn't have turned my back on God. I allowed my neighbor to defile my spirit and to take my joy when I should have preached to them and I should have stood fast and I should have been strong in the Holy Ghost. But I allowed them to take my joy. Hallelujah. He was under condemnation. This is why, folks, that holiness is a big part of living for God. <laughs> Praise God. Why is holiness even a big part? I'll tell you why. Because God wants you and I to be liberated. He wants us to be, amen, to be separate from this world. And what he means by that is he doesn't want you to look, talk, act, drink, walk, do everything like the world. He wants you to be separate from the world. You know the sad thing I was talking to the preacher? I'm not even going to say his name. I was talking to the preacher the other day. He says, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking beer. Wow. I said, man, this is an apostolic telling me this. This wasn't a Presbyterian, Episcopalian. This wasn't anybody else. This was an apostolic apostle's doctrine, preaching, guy telling me he doesn't see anything wrong with drinking alcohol. I said, you're lost than an African goose and goose underneath the sandstorms. He says, what do you mean? I said, of course it's wrong to drink alcohol. I'm going to tell you right now, it's wrong to drink alcohol if you are born again, heaven-bound believer, Christian. It's wrong. It's a sin. It'll send you to hell. Let me tell you what else will send you to hell. Cigarettes and drugs and marijuana, all that kind of stuff. It will send you to hell. I'm preaching the truth right now. I don't know. There's some of you that probably don't agree with me, but I'm going to tell you as long as I'm the pastor, I'm going to tell you it's wrong. You can go to hell if you keep doing those things. And I'm telling you, it's not because we're trying to be better than the world. We're not. We're trying to be different from the world. We're a different creature. We're different people. What the Bible calls us a peculiar people. The, the world is not supposed to win you. You're supposed to win the world. Because in this day and time, we're, ungodliness needs our voice. Ungodliness needs our authority to overcome boundaries of the devil. If we don't do it, nobody else will. If we don't preach the truth, nobody else will. Oh, it's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. I'm telling you, there's a mess of things. I'm not sicking on one subject tonight. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, there's several things I need you to tell my people that it's to be ye separate from the world. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. But if we're in sin, if we're living a double life, hear me now. If we're living a double life, amen, we're a little left-footed when it comes to operating the Holy Ghost Spirit. Just don't work out. Just doesn't work that way. You can't work in the gifts. If you're double-minded, like the book of James 5 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't live for God, then go to rock concerts. <laughs> can't go to church on Sunday, then hit the bar on Mondays. Doesn't work that way. 
You can't say, oh, praise God on a Sunday night and go off and start committing fornication and adultery. That's not going to send you to heaven. What that's going to do is that's going to condemn you to a worse place. It's not the most popular message I wanted to preach, but can I just tell you what God gave me? That's all I'm here to do. That's all I know how to do is preach what the Holy Ghost gave me. Why, God? Because there's sin in the church that God is trying to deal with. He's trying to reach you, but you're not listening. He's trying to move you, but you're unmovable. Hallelujah. You can't, you can't operate in the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. If you're living a double life, don't you go and pray for people. If you're not living right for God, don't you, try to, don't you try to meddle in with the gifts because you're going to curse yourself. The Bible says there's a plague and a curse on your life for those who meddle in the gifts. Get right with God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Why do we got to be clean? Because we are, we are going to be at the dinner table with the ungodliness. Amen with this world. But David couldn't come to dinner. And so Absalom gave voice and said, Come on up, Abnam. Go with us all. All the boys, we're all going to come together. We're all going to eat. Verse 28, Absalom commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Abnam's heart is drunken with wine, when I say the word, get him. Kill him. And kill him and don't be afraid. That's what the Bible says. NIV version. Don't be afraid. And the servants of Absalom did unto Abnam what Absalom had commanded. And all the king's sons arose. Every man gathered him on the mules and took off. If Absalom was so in this building tonight, I would tell him, I totally understand your anger. I would agree with you how you feel and your wrath for justice and I understand why you're so bothered and troubled with the things that you're wrestling with. And I see your deluded mind. But Absalom, if you were here tonight, I would remind you, be aware of the bitterness that can get in your heart. The root of bitterness. Amen. And I see your deluded mind. And I see how it goes. But you still have to be aware of the root that starts to plant the tree of bitterness in your spirit. Don't take the judgment into your own hands. I would tell Absalom, you don't know this because you're trapped in a horror, in a broken world. But if you were alive today, I'd take you, by the, I'd take you all the way to Hebrews chapter number 12. And I'd read verse number 15 to you looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest the root of bitterness spring up and troubling you. I would tell Absalom, I, got, I get why you're so mad. But let me take you to Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. Absalom, it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in doing so shall he clothe his head. Absalom, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If I had Absalom in this room here tonight, I would tell him, amen, don't fall for your lustful brothers, Amnon's sins, and your father's David's struggle. But submit yourself to your, old, your other brother, Jesus Christ, who can handle vengeance and never, listen, never get bitter. Never get bitter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop right here and just tell you, we, you and I cannot handle vengeance. Amen. We, if we do, we will stop revival. We'll stop revival. Taking judgment and bitterness into our own hands. Amen. Our children need to know there's a better way. Stop showing our kids today, amen, that it, that the ungodliness of this world. What are you talking about, Pastor? 
I'm talking about be an example to your kids. Because your kids see everything, and what they see is what they do. You ever hear the old song, monkey see, monkey do? Yeah, kids see, kids do. If they see mama and daddy not going to church, guess who's not going to church in the future? If they see mom and dad, amen, cussing at the dinner table, guess who else is cussing? If they see mom and dad, amen, not running aisles, guess who's not going to run the aisles ever? If they, my, my, my. I'm telling you, you better discipline your kids. You better tell them there's a God and his name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Our children need to know there's a better way. They need to know this apostolic truth. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of seeing our kids just looking at each and every one inside the house of God while others are praising and worshiping God and they're standing in the back just looking with nothing in vague places. I'm telling you, that is a sign that they are going to grow without Holy Ghost guidance. If I'm going to train my kid, I'm going to make sure the only way I can do it is not by forcing them, but by praising God and coming inside the house of God and saying, look, son, this is how you do it. And demonstrate to live for God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Got to show them that it's prayer time when prayer time starts. How do you show them, Pastor? You start by praying. You start by getting inside the prayer closet. And you start letting them see you pray. Because what they see is what they do. I want my babies living for God. Hallelujah. If they're going to be, if anybody's going to be example in their life, it's going to be their dad. And it's going to be their mom. I don't want you to be the example. I want the parents to be the example. Just like I want your kids to be, I want you to be the example of your own kids. To praise God, to live for God, to do what you're supposed to do inside the house of God. Amen. That way your kids will know and they will see. My, my, my. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to preach to Tamar right now. I've already spoken to Absalom. I've already preached to Abnam. I want to preach to the daughter right now. The spirit of victimizing. The spirit of victims. This is what the Lord had given me. He says three spirits. Your church is battling vengeance, victimizing, negligence. Three that represent David's kids. Tamar was defiled in the house of David. She was defiled inside there. Whose reputation was wrecked and because of all that that happened to her, she looked towards Absalom. Nowhere else to turn. Daddy didn't care. Brother wanted her out. She had one sibling, one half sibling left. Or friend left. Absalom came to her. And she says this, oh, oh Absalom, my savior, my friend, one who would bend an ear for me, one who side with me, one who will, 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 will go with me to the end. These people are against me, and so I need you to be against them. I don't know how to say this, so I'm just going to say it like this. It's not necessary for you to gain the friendship of one person to hate the others. It should never even be that way. If you're going to gain friends, you've got to build up a foundation that's going to be suitable enough that's going to get a vivid point, stronghold of this relationship between you and a friend. Too much of this junk going on. Well, 
I'm going to be his friend, so I'm just going to hate them. It don't work that way, y'all. Praise God. Don't hate somebody else just to be somebody else's friend. Love one another. That's why Jesus, you know what? Let me tell you what the Lord did. The Lord sought kings in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And this is how upset God was. Because of everything that was going on, Jesus said, my, 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 I'm going to have to do something about this because all I can do is speak, show them the hand of God, and do all this type of stuff. If they see me like Thomas sees, then they're going to believe it. So Jesus, the Bible says, manifested in the flesh. So he came down, and you know why he came down? He didn't come down just to save your hide from sin and hell. He came down to show you, listen, this is how we got to do it. Listen, this is how we got to love people. This is how we got to walk. This is how we got to talk. If my mama, if nobody else is going to show them, then let Jesus Christ be the example that he wrote in the word of God for you and I. Hallelujah. Praise God. So don't ever hate the individual. Amen. For the hand of fellowship of somebody else. Praise God. You know, Absalom should have said, you know, I'm mad too, Tamar. I'm upset. I'm with you on this. I understand. Amen. But we can't allow these spirits to take away our joy. Oh. <laughs> we can't allow an individual hey man I know what it's like hey man to be depressed I know what it's like hey man to not have a true walk with God you know why because every time an individual comes inside the house of God I see the look on your face on how you struggle to live for God you sit in the back and you cross your arms, but you're looking all the way around and you're saying in your mind, I wish I can do that, but I can't. What's that old saying? Actions speak louder than, than words. <laughs> it's hard to live for God when you ain't living for God. I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost moves, you can't fake it. There's no fake in the Holy Ghost. When God moves, that's when the true colors begin to stand out. But let me tell you something. That's the best situation that you could ever be in because that's the conviction of God coming on you. And when God, if he's got enough time to convict you, amen, he's got enough time for you to get to heaven. I've said it before, man. Y'all wanted a Joe Osteen? Y'all could have hired a Joe Osteen. I'm just going to preach to you exactly what the Holy Ghost gave me. I don't care if it gives me likes or dislikes or hearts or happies. I'm just here to preach what God has given me. And God said, there's three things I need you to preach against. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. You ever want to know how your spirit's right with God? If you're ever contemplating, you're ever wondering, I wonder if I'm right with God. Get inside your car and jump on the I-40 and let a dude cut you off. The Bible says the inside inward man will reflect on the outside. What's on the inside will come on the out. You can't hide it. You can't fake it, can't hide it. Listen, I understand there's, there's spirits that are bound in us, but you got to understand there's one thing that God has really blessed me with, and that's the discernment of spirits. And I can discern when you're depressed, and I can discern when you're up, and I can discern when you're down. But I also can discern when you're lying to me. I'm doing good, Pastor. I'm all right. I'm fine. Everything's great. Cherry, strawberry. No, it ain't. I'm telling you, if you're real with yourself, you can be real with God. But if you can't be real with yourself, you can't be real with God. Because God's going to look at you and say, who are you kidding, dude? How is that? Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, God, I hate life. Just praise God. Praise the Lord. I understand we got to have a mask on. That's true. We do. I do. There's times I have to. 
Because if I don't, how am I going to counsel somebody who they're feeling like junk and I come to their house and I'm like, you ready, man? Let's go. We're going to counsel each other. Probably end up drinking beer and watching Mary and Grace. Can't let that happen. Yeah, I'm talking about being strong, but I'm also saying be real with God, but also be real with yourself. Stop faking your walk with God and start being real with God. Start being real. You are greater. Listen to me, folks. You don't understand what you have. You've got a spirit that God has designed to destroy the enemy. Uh, You have something greater inside of you. Something great. That's why he said greater. There's nothing greater than great. Once you go beyond greater, there's, there's nothing beyond that. And that's why Jesus said, greater is he. He's talking about himself. He said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There's no one greater than that. If he is greater inside of you, if you've got, if you've got that greatness inside of you, I'm telling you, you have enough power to destroy devils. <clears throat> Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I... You and I, we need friends today. Listen to me. We have to have friends that's going to lift us up and not tear us down. You need friends that's going to bring the inner visions out of you. That's going to bring the inner burdens and the inner zeal that you have for God inside of you. You don't need a friend who brings out the weakness and the slothfulness inside of you. You don't need a friend that comes to you and says, well, let me tell you something, man. I don't know about, I don't know about Pastor, but I think he's an idiot. And uh, I, if you want to keep going to church there, you go right ahead. I'm not going to go to church there because Pastor, uh, uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a biography, but I just think he's dumb. You don't need friends like that. You need friends that are going to talk about the things of God, and they're going to talk, about, they're going to talk against the things of the devil. Hallelujah. Praise God. You need friends that's going to, listen, when you get to a house and, and say, it's, we all, we get, in, we get in huddles and we get in these, uh, what do you call them, and, and the, native, the natives get together, tribes, tribes and, or whatever. You get together. Powwows. Praise God. There you go. Pow. Amen. Well, we get together like that as Christians. You know why? Because we love to eat. Well, I love to eat. But we get together. And uh, when we get together, we start talking about the things of God. We start talking about how good God is. We start talking about the mercy of God and what God can do in our lives. Oh, I'm sorry. Does that, does that sound new to some of y'all? Or do we sit around and say, well, I can't stand sister so-and-so. They just... They're not on, uh, I don't know, but well, well, what do you think about Betty? I don't know, Betty's just kind of weird, you know. Uh, what do you think about, well, I think the pastor's taking all the ties and he's spending it in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> what I'm saying is, know who your friends are, know the people you walk with, because the Bible says this, ooh, the Bible doesn't say this. He says, and I command you, my people, to withdraw yourself from every brother, every sister that walketh disorderly of the Lord. You can love them. You can praise them. But you ain't got to go in that dark alley with them and drink a 40-ounce bottle of beer with them. Praise God. Amen. But somewhere I got to get back into the book. I got to tell Tamar, amen. I'm not the brother. I'm not the one coming. But let me tell you something, Tamar. There's one that's on his way. And he's going to make everything all right. There's one on his way. And he's going to make the sunshine in your world. He's going to put the wind at your back. He's going to make everything okay in your life. Why? Because you desire those things. 
How many, I ask you tonight, who are broken, twisted victims of everything that's gone wrong? Sadly, but truthfully, some of them, listen to me, have been hurt inside the house of God. They've been hurt in church. Some of them didn't get their wounds on the outside, Brother Rosetta. Some of them got their wounds on the inside of the house of God. Hallelujah. So because of all of that, because I'm not going to emphasize on that God's greater than these things, I have to go to Tamar and say, listen, Tamar, don't judge the entire congregation based off of one brother's actions. Don't withdraw yourself from the congregation just because you had a heyday with one person inside the house of God. God don't look at you and say, feel sorry for you. If you pull away from God, God says, that's your fault. You should have stayed because my mercy is still at the foot of the cross. You can't run from your problems, but you can run to the problem sober. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't judge the church because somebody did you wrong. Praise God. And don't judge me because I didn't get a magic wand and wave everything over and all the thing, everything was fixed when it wasn't. I'm flesh and blood just like you and I. But I'm going to tell you this, as a pastor, I'm going to do my best to pray for you. I'm going to do my best to preach the word of God, amen, in truth. I must do my best, amen, to, to, to be a shepherd that's supposed to lead this church into the right direction. But I can only do so much if you don't want to follow, that is up to you. If you don't want to listen to the man of God, that is up to you. I can get to heaven and I can tell God, God, I did my part. I told them they didn't listen. Hallelujah. Tamar, yes, you've been done wrong. She's threw away her entire covenant. Praise God. And she said, if this is the way church is, then I don't want nothing to do with it anymore. If this is the way God's people are, then I don't want nothing to do with it anymore. I, I had a really good friend that was just a little bit older than me when I was 17 years old. Sister Sandra. The first time I ever met Sister Sandra was when her, her twin sister came in and they were identical twins. And we were in revival with Brother Winslow back in 1997. Sandra and her twin sister came in. They sat in the back. Our church was packed out. It was full. We were in revival. God was doing miraculous things. Holy Ghost was moving. And I sat right beside Sister Sandra because I was backsliding at that time. I was backslidden in my heart. I had a suit on. Oh, I looked the part. But on the inside, when I got out of church, I went back to my friends and I smoked cigarettes and I drank beer and I did all kinds of stuff. But I didn't, the church didn't know that. I sat right by Sandra. She came in. Brother Winslow started preaching the word of God and he just started prophesying left and right. And he was going from the front and, God, and, I, got, and I got scared. I said, man, he's going to come to me and he's going to call me out. He's going to read my mail. And I said, well, this is it, this is it, God. He goes right over me, and he goes straight to Sister Sandra. And I'm thinking, Phew. I turn and look. I turn around, Sister Sandra and her twin sister are on the floor, sobbing. I've never seen anybody sob the way I've seen Sister Sandra and her twin sister sob. They were sobbing together on the floor like babies and shaking in convulsions. After I learned what had happened, Brother Winslow had whispered in their ears and prophesied to them one by one, and they went down. Sister Sandra later told me the story. She said, you don't even understand what he told me. I said, what did he say? She said, you don't even know what happened. She says, I came into that church that night, my sister and I, hand to hand. We were both dealing with life and struggles and all kinds of stuff and family problems. She said, I'm not, I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but God has, has done something to me that he has never done before. She said, my sister and I, we were invited to your church, and we weren't going to go. And my sister said, well, maybe we should just go to this church before we do what we're going to do. 
She says, we had plans. Brother Danny, she says, after church, my sister and I, we planned to get in the car and drive off the cliff and kill ourselves. We were contemplating suicide. Nobody knew it. When Brother Winslow came up, the Holy Ghost spoke and said, Oh, you're trying to kill yourself. The devil has been whispering in your ear to end your life. To end it all right now, there's nothing left for you. You better go ahead and end your life. But God intervened and said, No, I've got something more powerful available for you. I've got something more mesmerizing for you. Let me tell you and stop and say this. There's a spirit of suicide in this church right now that is the devil's trying to tell you he's trying to end your life with God it's a spiritual suicide the devil's trying to discord your life with God he's trying to get you to to stop worshiping God you know how you backslide you backslide when you stop coming to the house of God you start to backslide when you stop lifting up your hands in the house of God. You know how you start to walk away from God is when you start to cut back further into the church and you start to look at everything else uh, and say, maybe I'll just uh, skip a little service here and skip a little service there and become, it starts to become, starts to become normal in your life. Let me tell you something. The devil wants to stop you from living for God because he sees the potential in your life and he knows what you're capable of. Matthew 12 and 20 says this, a bruise reed shall he not break and smoke and flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment into victory. Tamar, there's another coming. There's another one coming. And he'll never lay a finger on you. Hallelujah. But he's righteous. He's a gender, a gentleman. And he's a shepherd. He's a lily in the valley. He's a bright and morning star. I know you've been hurt. But don't throw away your promises that God has given you. Don't throw away what God has already promised you in your life. Don't throw away your covenants. You haven't seen everything that God has promised you yet. Because somewhere in the darkest pages in human history and the most loneliest nights came a voice that said, I am Jesus, the son of David. Ezekiel 34, I will seek that which is lost. And bring again that which was driven away. And, I, and will bind up that which was broken. And listen to this. And strengthen that which was sick. He came here tonight afflicted. But you haven't seen nothing yet. What God wants to do in your life. There's one amen coming. That's going to find the Tamars. The abuse. The slander. The hurt. The hurt. The, the, the accused, oh yes, you can destroy a soul with your tongue. You can destroy lives with your tongue. Your tongue can kill people. It can crush a spirit like a Coke can. Yeah, your tongue can. Amen. That's why the Bible says in 1821, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Isaiah 6, 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Chapter number 2, the, the, the proclaim of the acceptable years of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Verse number 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and they that might call the trees of righteousness planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified right now. I prophesy against the spirit of heaviness that is trying to seduce our people and our young people in the house of God here tonight. Because I'll tell you right now, there is another brother coming for his church. 
right now. Who's going to restore your joy? Who's going to restore your marriage? Who's going to restore your walk with God? Who's going to restore your health? Who's going to restore? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 2 Samuel, Tamar was caught in beautiful garment. But her beauty shined. Her shined all the days of her life. But when she was violated, she became sick. She became depressed, oppressed. Anxiety kicked in. And in not so many words, but the Bible describes her outward appearance to be dull and black and white when it used to be bright and colorful. I believe that God was telling us this as a demonstration of your spirit. You can be bright or you can be dark. Because I'm going to tell you something, darkness cannot set in with light. Light always overshadows darkness. Hallelujah. And I come to tell somebody here tonight, you don't have to live in darkness anymore. You don't. Darkness is over. You don't have to live there. Did you hear what I said? You don't have to be down anymore. You can live for God. If you really want to live for God, you can. With joy. With happiness. With excitement. You can. Did you know that when you're excited in the house of God, that it excites God himself? You're not fooling me. You're not. My, my, my. Musicians, if you want to come, I'm done. I'm. Praise God. Hallelujah. Restoration is in this building right now. God is in the business of restoring lives. He's in the business of restoring marriages, spirits, families, churches, everything about you in your walk with God. He's here to restore you. Praise God. We want, we want answers. We want answers like you wouldn't believe. The biggest thing, now I'm just going to tell on myself, my wife can contest to this. I don't struggle with cigarettes. I don't struggle with drugs or alcohol, cussing, doing any of that stuff. I don't struggle with that. Let me tell you what I've been struggling with lately. I don't even struggle with people. I have been struggling these past few months like no one's business on where to find a church building or where we can have church at. I've been struggling. Brother Rodriguez, I ain't gonna lie. I've been, it's been a big struggle in my life. I said, God, we got the money in the bank, but we want to make the right decision on what we do with this building. And I, it got to the point where I was like, are we ever going to get... And then when I got that phone call from Brother Carl Shirty, you ain't going to have a church, Pastor, because uh, God's going to come back. And I said, man, well, thanks for ruining my day. And it just got worse and worse. That was just a few months ago. That's where it all started. <clears throat> I started praying. Listen, if you talk to God about your issues, about your little things, it doesn't even matter. God will respond, but he responds in different ways. Now, I'm not going to tell you that because you pray and you ask God, God reveal this. Make this plain enough for someone like dumb as me so I can understand it. And God doesn't come down like a 3D dimensional, oh, let me tell you, or burns a bush. Hey, listen, I was so desperate. I was looking for an answer. I was praying, and my dog was right there. And I was like, oh, in Jesus' name, you're going to speak through saint like you did with the donkey. I was looking for a... And th until this, listen, folks, I started asking God, God, give me a dream. Oh, you, you speak to me so much in my dreams, God, when I ask you to. And I don't ever ask you so much, God, because I feel like I'm so unworthy to keep asking you. But this night I asked God, I said, God, give me a dream. I don't care how it is. Just give me a dream. 
God gave me a dream. Not that night, but he gave me a dream the second night. In this dream, Brother Rosetta, this is how it went. I felt like I was at the beach, but I wasn't. Everybody knows I like the coast. It must have been the rocks. But it was rocks like my, my house rocks on my, my driveway. And it was all over the property. And it was like a white wooden building. The wood was sideways. And I walked in. When I walked in, it was very tall, as tall as this building. And then on one side, it had the sanctuary. And it had pews that went all the way down. It was so beautiful. The way it looked, it was very vivid. And everything was beautiful. <laughs> the walls, the, the, the chandelier, there was a foyer. There was these seats. And, and on the other side, was, there, was a, there was a fellowship hall. There was a kitchen. There was all this. Everything was all together in one. Upstairs, there was a row, just like here, but it was a little bit different. And it had classrooms. It was so beautiful. And I remember seeing that. And I was so amazed by it. I said, God, this is not like a million dollars right here. This is just something basic for us. I said, this is what you have for us in God. This is what we want. I was so excited in the dream. When I woke up, the first thing that I said before my feet hit the floor, I turned to my wife. I said, God is giving us a church. I said, God gave me a dream about the way it's going to look. Now, Tomorrow may come and we may get a building. It may look a whole lot different. I don't know. But in this dream, it was so real that, listen, I, I refuse to listen to the enemy to tell me that these things will not happen. I refuse to listen to somebody and say, well, you just had a lot of pizza the other night. No, I prayed and God gave me a dream the way it's going to look. If you would just open up your mouth and you would talk to God, and you say, God, restore my life. Restore my walk with you, God. I want to renew my walk with you tonight, Jesus. God's in a saving business. If you want to renew your walk with God, I want to invite you to an old-fashioned altar. I want to invite you to a place where you can make amends with your God tonight and say, God, one more time, use me for your glory. Use me for your ministry, God. But make amends with him tonight and say, God, I want to be as real as I can with you. I want my family saved. I want my mom saved. I want my dad saved. I want everybody saved, God. But before you save them tonight, God, save my soul. My relationship with you has got to be right with you, God, tonight. My relationship has got to be on top scale with you tonight, Jesus. If you've got odds against your brother, you better make it right tonight. If you've got odds against your sister, you better hug her neck tonight because she is not worth going to hell over. No one is worth going to hell over. Come on, consecrate tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus.